So I just want to welcome everyone um, to our webinar today. We're really excited about. Um, there's a lot of information crammed in here, so we're going to try to get through it, and then we'll uh, share our um, a PDF with all of our slides and resources um, in an email after the webinar. So um, this webinar is. Um, for is at home with kids during COVID, and all of the panelists today are um, parents. Um, family Voices of Minnesota, if you're not familiar, our mission is to cultivate strong families across Minnesota by connecting them with one another for support and information uh, so that they can become em empowered advocates, improving the health and quality of life for their children and youth with special health care needs and disabilities. Uh, so a little bit about who we are at Family Voices. Uh, there's seven staff members, and we have an army of uh, over 180 trained volunteer support parents throughout the state of Minnesota. Uh, so all of us are parents. Um, we're a supportive network. Uh, we celebrate together. We support each other through challenges and difficult emotions um, and joyful ones as well. Uh, you can imagine with that many parents, there's just a wealth of different perspectives, experiences, um, cultures, family life. Um, and then um, many of us are parent leaders and advocates, and we're doing work within systems and mentoring one another for future leadership as well. So we serve families um, through our staff availability, um, being able to web chat, phone call, email. Um, Monday through Friday, uh, we do direct parent matches according to a family's needs or um, diagnoses or um, challenges that they're facing. Uh, we have a variety of parent groups, all of which are virtual at this point. Um, and we do webinars like the one we're doing today. Uh, we share resources primarily through our website, um, but also through social media and direct support of families. And um, we do family leadership trainings, and then we partner with organizations and professionals. So our webinar today is about um, being at home with kids. And I think um, it's been a really challenging time and uh, that's across all households, but particularly when you have children with special health needs, uh, the isolation is already there and it can be amplified and the um, anxiety and concern and just the intensity of life is really amplified. So um, I'm gonna, I'm Jamie O'Connor, I'll do my introduction in a minute, um, but there's three parts to this, uh, the medical care and uh, preparedness, and then uh, learning at home with Courtney Cruz and mental health and behavioral impacts with Terry Betcher. So like I said, my name is Jamie O'Connor and I am the Outreach Coordinator for Family Voices of Minnesota. Um, I'm here as a parent. I have two kiddos, that's Charlie with the pretty red hair, and Nora is um, my nine-year-old who has a rare genetic condition. Um, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about medical care during COVID-19, um, and that's a host of, of things that I'm hoping that this piece will provide some reassurance and, and direction. Um, this would not be a COVID-19 presentation if we didn't talk about um, how to stay well. And uh, these are the CDC guidelines for staying well. Um, and I think we've all heard this over and over, so I won't read them to you, but I feel like it's really important to understand how we can uh, try to remain as healthy as possible right now. So one of the things that families with uh, children with complex needs uh, should be doing or should have already done would be to prepare for um, an emergency. One of the best tools for doing that is the emergency information form from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, again, I will send this link out. Um, in general, that's a form that you would fill out with your child's physician, but that doesn't mean that you can't use it independently and, um, and work with your physician at another time. So I encourage everyone to have that ready to go um, in case of an emergency. The other link that I've provided here that you can explore are um, 
is a fantastic article about COVID-19 pr preparations that includes information about stocking your home, medical supplies, medications, um, em emergency planning in case you get sick um, and someone else needs to care, care for your child. Uh, it's a fantastic article. And then always with emergency planning, uh, you need to be working with your child's providers and communicating with them to make sure that the plan uh, does in fact work for them and contains all of the information that it needs to. Um, we, my son had a little bike accident um, a couple of weeks ago and he had to go and get stitches. Um, and so I wanted to cover general preparedness and some things you can do ahead of time so that if you're in an urgent or emergent situation, you already have answered some questions and you don't have to originate them in that stressful environment. Um, one is to think about where you'll go. Uh, if the emergent or the care is virus related or um, if it's not, because uh, you're probably gonna, you might go to a different place. Uh, whether the person needing care is an adult versus a child. Um, for example, my son could go to a regular urgent care, but my daughter, had it been her, would have needed to go straight to the children's hospital. Um, and then uh, is telehealth an option? Uh, and then answering the who about which adult will accompany the child. Many hospitals and clinics are limiting to one adult. Um, and then who could stay home with other children if there's um, a situation and can you go ahead and communicate that that's your plan ahead of time and then what to expect when you arrive uh, you can research your family's um, medical provider and what they're how they're responding to the pandemic and understand that you may want to call ahead especially if you're having if your child or you are having virus related symptoms uh, some families are really afraid to seek care right now, and so I think I'm, that's why I'm hoping to offer some reassurance um, because uh, care is really important to all of our families, medical care is. Um, I've listed here, and I won't read them all, but um, I, I was so impressed with the measures that the urgent care took uh, when we took our son in. Um, there was a sterile clinic. And then they had other urgent cares that were for respiratory or virus related symptoms. Um, the screening going in was really fantastic. It wasn't simply about fever. It was about a whole host of symptoms that could indicate virus. Um, they of course did temperature checks and um, they provided a cloth mask coming um, right when we came in the door. Uh, staff were wearing personal protective equipment. There was plexiglass. Um, is a whole host of things. So again, research what your, the places that you might go and what to expect and how they're um, coping. I do want to mention that surgeries, non-essential and elective surgeries and procedures have um, resumed, I think, on a limited basis. And so if that's something that you or your child is facing, uh, you can work with their provider to determine when you um, and the provider think that that's safe and to find out what precautions and additional risks are there. Um, my family has been using telehealth for medical, uh, for my daughter's therapies, as well as for uh, mental health counseling. And, um, and we've had a lot of success with this. And I know that a lot of um, providers and clinics have really um, upped their game on telehealth because of COVID-19. Uh, so telehealth is a secure virtual appointment, uh, could be with your doctor, therapist, um, could cover mental health, um, occupational, speech, physical therapy. Um, there is an excellent resource from Family Voices National that has all of these uh, telehealth resources. So tips from family organizations, uh, the pediatric guidance, videos to help prepare, there's um, tear sheets for preparing for therapy visits, and um, then if for anyone interested in the actions and policies um, and adjustments that are quickly being made, and then also what's covered. So again, that resource will go out. Um, and then I just wanted to encourage everyone to practice at home with your kiddos as a way of being prepared. Um, not everyone will wear a mask, but there's a lot of ways that we can prepare our kids um, 
for visits, but also for the big wide world that we live in it can be a little scary right now. Uh, and these are just some resources again that I'll send out that is um, some develop or some um, children's geared resources for helping to helping them to understand the coronavirus. And I will go back, Courtney, um, our next presenter made sure to mention this when we were planning and in including um, in, in promoting understanding for our kids, she pointed out that we really need to limit and monitor their access to news um, to try to make sure that they're getting information that's relevant to them without being very scared and anxious. Um, more telehealth resources that will go out in the email. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Courtney Cruz, and I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, Courtney. Yep, yep, you are. Hi, I'm Courtney Cruz. Um, this is my family. Apparently, we only take selfies. Um, my husband, um, I have four boys, a husband and a husband. Um, I have two typical kids, and one is uh, learns differently, and then I also have a son with Down syndrome. I am a homeschooling mom, and um, we home educate. I homeschool using the classical model of education, um, which teaches to the de developmental stage of where the child is at using classical conversations as curriculum and community. I've been doing this for seven years. So my oldest is entering seventh grade next year. Thank you. Um, you can go ahead and advance the slide. I'm trying to figure out. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, we have all been distance learning with school and what the school has been asking us to do is kind of impossible. If you are a working parent and you don't know the material and you don't have all the resources that your child's teacher has, there's no way you can do this effectively, um, you know, using best practices. There's no best practices, right? So if you're working and schooling, bless you. You've, you've had a long road and you didn't sign up for this. I'm guessing you're finding this a little bit challenging. Um, homeschooling parents focus for several hours a day. They are able to prepare ahead of time and we're able to fully understand and know the material that we're teaching um, to provide an education for our children. And if you haven't had access to that, that's really difficult. Go ahead. So while home educating is probably temporary for most, we have an amazing opportunity, right? We can look when we, I want you to take a minute and think about what are the positive things that are coming out of this for you and your family. You get to be home with your family all the time. You get to help them master skills and hobbies. Um, my kids have gotten into, you know, as a homeschooler, we have been home a lot more since this COVID thing too. Ordinarily, we would be out almost every day of the week doing activities or sports or whatever. But um, my kids have learned to mastering a bunch of different hobbies. I have a kid who's like obsessed with fishing right now and he's learning how to fillet a fish. He's 10. <laughs> I have a kid who's learning how to, um, from YouTube, learning how to um, whittle, you know. So these are, these are skills that I don't think we otherwise would have been exploring because we're home. Um, with that, we have the time to be curious and creative. Our kids are inventing new games and new things that they can um, create because of this time. And our time together, wow, our relationships have even improved. Even as homeschoolers, we just that more time has been helpful to us. You can go ahead. Thanks. So there's a bunch of myths that you may be telling yourself or may have been thinking. Um, I could never homeschool my children, never, right? I want you to think about that. You love your kids, right? Any 
any parent with a strong love for their child can participate in their child's education. Um, you may think I'm not qualified, like I don't have a teaching degree, right? But remember when your child was diagnosed with whatever, whatever thing they need a diagnosis for? You learned pretty fast, <laughs> didn't you? I mean, I can think back when my son with Down syndrome was born. I did a lot of research really fast um, and learned all about him and what his needs are, are and, and continue to be. I mean, we keep learning all the time, don't we? And that's what homeschooling is too. You may not have chosen this, but you are learning quickly as you go, right? Um, your love for your child qualifies you as their teacher. You were their first teacher. You are still a, a great teacher for them. Um, you can go ahead. So homeschooling versus distance learning, it, it looks a little different. Um, I have a son with Down syndrome who goes to public school preschool, and we have gotten all kinds of recommendations and things that the teachers have sent us for distance learning. And as a homeschooler, I have specifically chosen not to do some of those things. Um, just because it doesn't go in the flow of our day. Um, and because I'm not controlling the material, it doesn't mean it's harder for me to implement, right? As a homeschooler, if I have the curriculum and the materials that I'm planning, I can implement it a lot easier. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's see, go ahead. So with my son who was in public school, um, honestly, I was not keeping up with the list from the school. I see the teachers putting their, their time in and working hard to really make this time of distant, distance learning beneficial. Um, and the number of things that they've put on us really felt heavy. Um, whether it was private therapies, mainstream activities from the, from the, you know, the classroom teacher plus the special ed teacher activities. I really had to look at the, all of the things that they sent me and pick a few. And I intentionally neglected others. I did communicate with his teachers. We're doing this, but not that. And this is my goal at home, but that is not. Um, this, this makes sense to me, that doesn't. Um, and I, I, that was received really well by his teachers. And actually I have a teacher like, make make a flashcard activity for or like a game for my son um because in the vein of what we were already doing which was thrilling to me because she was supporting us where we were at home so it really um it was a good thing for us <laughs> so i i guess if you're going to distance continue distance educating in next year, I would just really be upfront with your teachers and be able to like confidently communicate with them saying, this is what we're doing. Can you help support us? Not instead of, you know, approaching and asking, this is telling them this is what we're doing and I need your support versus saying, this is, I'm waiting for you to tell me what to do. You know what I mean? Okay. You can advance the slide. So if you are considering homeschooling for next year, I mean, we still don't know what the future holds, right? We don't know if there'll be like major social distancing. Will they be asking our kids to wear masks at school? Like that's not practical for my kid. Um, there may be some of you thinking about homeschooling, you know, temporarily or long-term or what does that look like? And actually there are a lot of different choices. You don't have to just like be home all the time. Of course, if you have a medically um, complex kiddo, you might choose to do that. But you, you know, the public school offers services and school, but they also have kind of like combination choices that they never tell you about. Or I, I don't know. I don't think I've ever heard the <laughs> school approach or ever heard of anybody being offered those types of programs from the school. 
But um, in Minnesota, we are allowed to also do public school part time. Um, and you can talk, and, and which would allow to have your child have an IEP. And then you can opt in or out of different services. Now, the school will say, oh, we can't do that, but you can. Um, so that might be something you talk to your team about. Homeschooling, um, you could also straight homeschool, but then opt into a service or a class. Like if you just want your kid to go to speech and you say, you go to the school and say, we're homeschooling, we've um, done the paperwork for homeschooling. Um, and in the state, in, I'll have links for that in the um, resources and how do you do that, and whatever. Um, but you can opt into like one service if you need. And you might need to bring your kid to the school to have that service met, but they will, they are willing to work with you. Online schools, um, home based charter program. We did this one year and it was not successful for my crew. Um, online school sounds great, but um, I think it could be done for older kids, but my little really struggled with sitting in front of the screen with um, the material being presented and then not being able to give a lot of feedback to the program. Um, so they were missing things because they were distracted, because it was a screen, because it was home and whatever. But there wasn't like a teacher checking in with them and the particular program that we were using. Um, and so, it, and, and they kind of became screen monsters, you know, when your kids get too many, too much time with the screen, they kind of become moody and frustrated and all this. So we did not like the, the computer school um, when we tried it, but I, I really think it could work for an older child. Um, you can homeschool on your own. Now this is gonna cost a little money. Um, the home-based charter program and the online school is all funded by the public schools. But if you're, if you're going to that on your own, there are a lot of programs that are on the cheap or, or free online um, that you can find, but they, you know, everybody, there are, are literally thousands of resources out there specific to homeschooling. So you can, you can do it on your own. It's gonna cost a little bit less money. Private schools do not have to follow state guidelines for um, that the public schools are following. And private schools may choose to not social distance. They may choose to social distance. I don't know what's gonna happen. Um, we'll see. But if you, if you, if that's a choice, private schools are a choice. Um, when you get into the world of homeschooling, there are tons of resources and communities. Um, homeschool co-op is, are uh, a way where parents volunteer to take a subject and teach the class of homeschool kids, um, whether it be usually electives, usually it's gym or music or um, art and that kind of thing. So and they generally meet once or twice a week. Um, homeschool communities, uh, we, I, we, we personally are part of a community called Classical Conversations and we we use a lot of the same curriculum, but some different. So the kids go, go once a week and they get to be with other kids doing the same thing. Um, and then there's parent support. There's uh, practicums and uh, educational opportunities for parents to learn how to teach their kids. And then also the kids feel supported because they're doing the same thing as other kids and relationships are built in. And mom relationships, mom and dad relationships are built in. And so it's, it's just a really nice way to do homeschool because you are supported, but it does cost a little bit more than doing it on your own. Um, so how in the world am I gonna do this, right? I think the first thing that you need to do is sit back and really look at your child and figure out what does my kid need to know? I mean, you can go to your IEP documents and say, okay, what they were working on these six things on the IEP. Um, do I want to use those things or do I want to do something different? Where, where do I see gaps? 
what we see is probably a little different than what school sees and what we think is important might be different than what they think is important and so you know i have a kid who really needs to work on his time table you know i have a kid who really needs to learn how to control his temper right maybe that's one of your goals and so setting goals for each child um, is probably the first thing that that i would do starting out the second thing you do is educate yourself what methods are there um, i do have a few resources that will be listed in the document that jamie sends out there are a hundred different ways to do this and um, a lot of education can be had for even free online youtube um, there's a lot of experts in the in the field of homeschooling who speak about um, how they do it for free online um, you know if you're looking at homeschooling just for a season just just because you're not sure about next year because there's a lot of uncertainties you may not buy into whole methods entire programs you might just really think about how can i piecemeal a home program that works for us right now without jumping in with with both feet right so you're so there are a bunch of different ways that you can do this on the cheap for free um temporarily and one method that i would encourage to look at is notebooking um, it checks off a lot of boxes you have your child read you have them write three to five sentences you have them um and you can talk about parts of speech in there you can talk about what they've learned specifically if it's like a science topic or if it's a topic um, of like hobby interest or whatever but then they journal about it and, that, and there's a lot of research that shows that when we write about things we know when we write about things we learn the things better and so um that would be a temporary program that i would that anybody can do at any time um the only thing that it probably leaves out is math so um you you know come up you know a math workbook you can go mathcafe.com and make just like addition sheets and multiplication sheets for your kids that's not um that's totally free and possible khan academy has entire free math programs um that you can just it, and it's k-h-a-n khan academy online it's totally free and um it actually kind of steps the child forward at their pace and that that is an excellent program to do on as a temporary solution um especially for an older child and if you are considering long term you can you can look at the methods and look at you know more education for yourself um we use the library we use um online resources youtube is a great resource too so there's a lot that you can do for free go ahead future tips and tricks um you need time to plan yourself you need time for mom or dad to make a um to make a plan for the next day for the next month for the next week whatever it looks like go back one get yeah, that one <laughs> um so you need to just have a plan for yourself so you know kind of what, what your you know if i don't have a plan we all just kind of everything gets lazy and sloppy <laughs> but if i know what i'm doing the next day it's a lot better um, every morning we have a morning meeting time we discuss schedules we discuss what's happening in the day um, we discuss expectations and during that morning meeting time we do a lot of um, we do memory work and we do uh, reading aloud and we do kind of just the, the you know we discuss what words mean and whatever and it's done really casually um, just at breakfast time um, so that is a, that is something any family can incorporate whether they're homeschooling or not we have loved it 
Um, discussing expectations of your children and making schedules for them, I think is a really important thing. We all do better when we know what's expected of us, right? Like my kids each have a list of things that they're supposed to do every day. And um, because they know that it's there and I know that it's there and we're all working together on this, they, um, they just respond better than if I spring it on them and say, hey, okay, now it's reading time. And they're like, what? I was just gonna go play outside or I was gonna do this Pokemon card thing, you know? So it, it, it helps to have those expectations and schedules thing with learning time between nine and 11 and then in the afternoon again between one and two or something, you know, just so that they know what to expect and what's coming. Um, I would start with my youngest kids first. I think if you're looking at your kids, your younger kids tend to just need their love buckets filled early in the morning. Um, and if I can fill their, fill his little love bucket and he comes next to me and I work with him first and he gets that mom time, he leaves me alone better when I'm working with the bigger kids. So um, that, and that might apply to working from home too for some of you struggling with how do I keep the, my kid out of my hair? You know, really um, something that I learned um, from some other expert, I can't remember who, he was saying just set a timer, 15 minutes, spend time, like close time with your child and then they will be done with you <laughs> and you will be free to do what you need to do because their little love bucket gets filled up and you get to move on to do other things. At our house, physical education is not an elective. Um, we all have better moods and go with the flow a lot easier if we have exercise. Um, I have a kid who needs a lot of movement to make him happy. Um, and if I know that he can just spend 20 minutes on the trampoline and come back to me, boy, he is a different kid and he is ready to work. Otherwise, um, sometimes we really butt heads. So I encourage you to get out and move your body if you're having a hard day and the hard days happen, <laughs> even to me and others who homeschool. So is that my last one? Oh yeah, and then there's resources and um, you can check those yeah. out. And, yeah, yeah we'll later. send these out um, as a PDF to everybody. Perfect. I'm happy That's to answer important. questions. Go ahead. I'm happy yeah, to answer I was questions say. later, I guess, whatever. Great. Perfect. Okay. All right. And feel free to chat your questions into the chat box, and then I, um, at the end, I can read them um, if, if you're worried that you'll lose your questions. So feel free to do that. And I also apologize about my glitches with the slides. Um, I'm going to try to do better. Um, with that, we are going to introduce Terry Betcher, and she's going to talk to us about uh, mental health and COVID-19. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Terry Betcher, and I'm a parent support navigator with Family Voices. I've been with them for about three and a half years. Um, this is my lovely family. Um, Allie is just turned 13 this past week, Aiden is 10, and my husband Dan and I have been together for um, 20 years. Um, we have a dog and a cat, and we live in uh, Mankato. And so my children are adopted, and they both have a uh, fetal alcohol um, syndrome disorder, and they also have a lot of um, mental health issues um, due to the fetal alcohol and due to adoption and some trauma that happened to them um, before they came to us. So. Um, and I also deal with some depression and anxiety and stuff. And I share that only to tell you that I am not a trained medical health professional, nor do I try to be. I just have learned a lot. I have a lot of lived experience um, as this kind of what Family Voices is about is, you know, we are parents that are not professionals, but we live the life and um, you kind of become educated in a lot of different areas. And so mental health is something that I've kind of have learned a lot about. So. Um, I'm just parent here supporting parents and, and hoping that we can all get through this crazy time together. Okay, next slide. So this corona 
COVID-19 outbreak has been very stressful to everyone. Um, whether you think your kids are showing it or not, there's a lot of fear and anxiety around it. Um, and around adults and adults, you know, fuel kids and kids fuel adults. And, um, but kids really rely on consistency and safety and having their basic needs met. And a lot of those things have been in question over the last couple months. Um, you know, they went to school one day and the next day, you're done with school. We're not going back for the end of the year, you know? And there was even a time frame in there where like, maybe you'll go back, maybe you won't. And now we're in a time of maybe you'll go back in the fall, maybe you won't. Um, you know, kids don't do well with that. They need to know what's gonna be happening and when it's gonna be happening. Um, basic needs, I mean, you know, we went for a month and a half with toilet paper shortages. I mean, if you can't get something as basic as toilet paper, like where's my next meal gonna come from? Are they gonna come take my house? Are they gonna come take my pets? You know, all of these things come into question when your basic needs aren't met. Um, you know, with food and school and, you know, a lot of kids come to school and, and um, use that as a, you know, a good source of support. And, um, you know, you're taking away another facet of their life that, that they don't have those relationships and those safe people that they talk to on a daily basis to make sure that everything's gonna be okay. All right, next slide. So I'm just gonna go over some kind of stress and anxiety signs for adults and kids. Um, we're also going to talk about um, uh, caregiver burnout, and then we're also going to talk about some um, ways to kind of cope with this and get everyone through it. So um, the first thing we're going to talk about are common signs of stress and anxiety, um, feeling of numbness and disbelief, that anxiety or fear, um, changes in appetite, activity, and energy levels, either increasing or decreasing, you know, depending on the person, those things can change, and they can change within the same person. So. Any changes in those sorts of things during your day, um, difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping, either falling asleep or falling asleep fine, but then, you know, waking up in the middle of the night. I know I suffer from both of those things. Um, physical reaction, you know, increased headaches, body aches that you can't explain, um, stomach aches you can't explain, skin rashes, or even worsening of chronic health problems. Um, people become angry and more short-tempered. They're definitely not as patient as they used to be. Um, you know, the littlest things kind of set me off and, and same for kids, you know, the littlest things set them off. And um, so we have to be aware of that, that their little bodies are adjusting to a lot as well. And then um, increased use of alcohol, tobacco, or drugs are something else that um, can kind of show that adults are, are stressed or have some high, high anxiety. Okay, next slide. Um, stress and anxiety in kids can look a little different um, than you would expect. I kind of call it, it's coming out sideways. Um, so there's excessive crying or neediness. Um, I know my 10 year old son um, definitely struggles with neediness and clinginess, even on the best of days. Um, and now that we have all these added stressors, which attack his basic safety needs, um, which is where he struggles the most at, is am I gonna be safe? Am I gonna be able to eat? Are you still gonna be around? You know, Where are you going? What are you doing? When are you coming back? Um, he struggles with all of that like I said, even on the best of days, and this has really been trying for him. Um, you might see some regression, toilet accidents, bedwetting, thumb sucking, baby talk. Um, you might see excessive worrying about things that might not on the surface seem COVID related, but um, you know, any excessive worry of any kind. You know, kids, kids create their own worry. So um, their little brains are always thinking, always wondering what's going on. Um, changes in eating or sleeping, unexplained pain or headaches, um, increased in intensity or frequency of tantrums or rages, um, depending on age of child and what they're going through. But so a child who might tantrum, you know, one time a day is now tantruming four or five times a day. Or maybe their tantrums started out with like, you know, kicking the wall and now they're like attacking you and yelling at you and, and they last for, you know, several minutes or sometimes even hours. Um, that's all, you know, signs of stress and anxiety and depression in kids. And then unfortunately, some kids turn to alcohol, drugs, or tobacco even. So next slide. So I'm sure you've all heard about <laughs> filling your bucket or the emotional cup. Um, Courtney referred to it a little bit earlier. Um, this is, this slide is kind of based for kids, but it, it's also very appropriate for adults as well. Um, we all need to keep our cups or our buckets full. Um, what fills a person's cup is play and friendships and relationships and connecting and feeling successful about something. 
in doing what you love and getting to choose to do what you love, whether it's crafts or exercise or, um, you know, whatever you do for hobbies, um, you know, laying in the grass, looking at the sun, like, you know, whatever it is that you enjoy, that you're able to do those things. Things that empty the cups are stress and strain, um, rejection by peers or friends, you know, isolation, yelling and punishing, fatiguing, and not being able to do what you want to do, being forced to do other things. Um, kids and adults handle these full cups and empty cups very differently. Um, some kids will have those kind of sideways behaviors where it looks like they're just being naughty, but really they're just trying to steal from your cup because their cup is empty. And they'll get that attention from you however they need to get it. If they can't get a positive, they'll get a negative. So they will try to feel, feel that stuff from your cup. Um, and they seem to have bottom of cups. And I feel that with my son every day. We have myself and my husband and my mother-in-law sees him often and we have PCAs and all everybody does all day long is fill his cup and fill his cup and fill his cup and it just never is full. He just is always needing more and more and more attention and time and um, he just, he never gets enough. Um, so he'll start to like bounce off the walls and just be really silly and you know be that kind of annoying little brother to his sister and and when he's just looking for something to go in so they have to um and they think they have to fight or compete for attention and to get those things to fill their cups because it just is never full okay next slide so some things we can do to support kids are to remain calm be available Avoid language where blame leads to stigma. And what I mean by that is, is really focusing on, um, especially with this particular crisis, focusing on what's important to your family and what your rules are. Um, and not so much looking at like what the neighbor's rules are or what the lady down the street or the lady in Walmart. You know, if your rules are, you know, we stay at home, we only go to the store once a week. When we do go to the store, we always wear masks and only mom goes. Um, we don't have friends over, then that's your rules. That's your family rules. That's what you've decided. We don't try to put blame on, you know, the next door neighbor because they get to go out and play all the time, you know, and why do they get to do that? And, and those are discussions that we've had in our house and we just have to keep reinforcing that this is, you know, what mom and dad have decided to keep us safe. And, you know, we'll keep monitoring and we'll keep thinking about it, but this is what we've decided that our family needs to stay safe because, you know, dad has some underlying health conditions or because, you know, sister has asthma or, you know, whatever the case is, um, but keeping it really based on what your family beliefs and wants and needs are. Pay attention to what they watch, listen, listen to um, on the radio and social media, like Cordy and Jamie both expressed. Um, I found that with my own kids, you know, at first I was really listening to a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, walls of speeches and Trump speeches and all of those kinds of things about talking about what was going on and the latest numbers and blah, blah, blah. And one day my 13 year old looked at me and she said, I just can't listen to this anymore. And then I realized that, you know, she was having a lot of anxiety about this and what this all meant. And it was all very confusing. And as I stopped listening it to, to her, I also found that it helped myself become less anxious about it. Um, and I really became a lot more picky about what I read and what I listened to and wasn't just listening to everything just to try and get all of this information. So be honest and as accurate as you can with your kids. Um, I kind of think of it like, you know, talking to them about sex and drugs and, you know, all of those kind of things that are out there that, you know, kids are curious about but are uncomfortable to talk about. Um, you know, bring it to their, to their level, you know, only answer what they ask. Um, also, with um with adoption you know we we only ask we only answer what they ask and if they have more questions they will ask more questions if you try to give them more information than what they ask for um that increases their anxiety and their you know it's like oh i never thought about that so only you know try to answer what they ask and if they want more information they will let you know and then teach them to be proactive you know all those things that jamie talked about like you know washing your hands and social distancing and you know um help them be creative with ways that they can communicate with their friends either through you know zoom videos or google hangout or whatever um so teach them ways that they can take care of themselves and not have to worry about what other people are doing um because we can't control other people we can't control if joe the neighbor is going to come closer than six feet to me but i can move away from joe 
you know, we can't control if that woman is going to wear a mask, but I can wear a mask. I can wash my hands. I can keep myself safe. And um, again, to reduce that stigma and to help them be proactive and feel like they have some power over what's happening. Okay, next slide. Uh, caregiver burnout um, is when you are emotionally, mentally, and physically exhausted from caring for people with special needs. Um, and I'm sure some of you have, if you aren't feeling it now, maybe have felt it in the past. Um, so it's really important that we take care of ourselves and um, don't let that snowball because that snowball gets big really quickly and really fast and it's really hard to stop once you're on a roll. Um, next slide. So I think I missed one. Can you go back one? No? Okay. Um, well, <laughs> the slide that's supposed to be next is um, uh, some signs for caregiver burnout. And those are similar to the anxiety and signs that I um, sent or that we talked about earlier as far as like um, hopelessness, depression, um, you know, not getting enough sleep, um, feeling really short and testy. Um, I, I like to talk to it about like when I talked about tantrums with kids, increasing in frequency and intensity, um, same with caregiver burnout. You feel all of the same anxiety and stress feelings but the intensity of them is more and the frequency of them is, is more. So, um, and you just feel like it's never gonna end. Like this is my life. I'm forever going to be taking care of these kids and I'm never gonna be able to take care of myself. So if you're feeling that, you really need to be aware of it and try to stop it in its tracks um, and get some help if you can. Um, so some ways to cope with stress are to stay informed, check your sources, make sure that your resources are reliable um, and not, like I said, not over overdo it. You know, try not to, um, you know, submerge yourself into it, like take it with as much as you can handle. Um, take care of your body, take deep breaths, breath, stretch, eat well and sleep you know, a lot, exercise, and avoid alcohol and drugs because those always kind of intensify those feelings. Um, make time to unwind and try to do some things that you enjoy. Um, card making is one of those things that I enjoy that I have taken up. Um, I used to do it all the time and then wasn't able to do it for a long time because of kids and other responsibilities. And now that I have more time at home, like Courtney said, like our creativity is expanding. And so I've just taken this time to, to embrace that again, and I'm really loving it. And um, so, you know, find some activities you enjoy or maybe something that you haven't tried before will be fun. Um, connect with others, um, talk to people about your concerns, make those phone calls, those video chats, send some cards. Um, again, as I was talking about, um, me making those cards and then I'm sending them out to people and I'm getting the response back that, oh, I just love that card. That was so great. Cause we don't get cards in the mail anymore. Like that just doesn't happen. So people are always kind of surprised by that. So not only is it filling my bucket by giving me a way to cope, it fills my bucket when they tell me how great it made them feel and it fills their bucket. So it's kind of an all around good thing. And then mindfulness activities. There are tons and tons of mindfulness activities on the, on the internet. Um, there's breathing apps that you can get on your phone that will like show you like breathe in for five seconds, push out for five seconds, you know, and they'll have a little visual that goes along with that. Um, journaling, meditation, yoga, sensory activities, like pull out your child's sensory box and just play in the beans and the noodles and the, the squishy things that they have and um, pet your animals, <laughs> you know, like just be really aware when you're petting them, like what they feel like and what they sound like and what they smell like and using all of your senses while you're doing those things. Um, those are some of the things that I do. Um, and just a side note on that, um, Family Voices does offer a journaling group once a month and I meant to look up the next date, but I forgot to do that before I got online quick here. So um, when Jamie comes back on, maybe she can remind us when that date is. And then we also have support groups that we offer. Um, I am doing one on June 2nd at 9 o'clock at night um, for those night owls, but we do have another one later in the month that's a little earlier in the day. So um, if support groups are your thing, these are virtual, so you can join, you know, from your, your bedroom or whatever. And um, they've been really a great way for me to reach out to people and for, I, I think people have found them really helpful. So next slide. And then these are just some resources. Like I said, I am not a mental health professional. I pretty much took everything that I had um, to give you from the CDC and from the Family Voices site. Um, we have lots of good resources on there like Amy, uh, Jamie talked about earlier. Um, I also got some from um, NOMNI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Health. 
and the Minnesota Department of Health, the COVID-19 response team had some really good information on there as well. Not all of it did I include on here, but there's more information out there if you want it. And then I wanted to include that um, Positive Psychology had some really great mindfulness activities um, for kids and for adults. And it, um, it did a nice job of explaining, of helping you to explain how mindfulness works for kids and so that you can explain that to your kids and what benefits they're getting out of it and why it's important. So um, I encourage you to check out those sites. There was tons and tons of ideas on there. So um, next slide. So any questions or comments, um, I think we can open up the lines or whatever. Feel free to address any of the three of us with any questions or comments, concerns, helpful thoughts that you have for other people. Um, I think we're open to whatever. So. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Terry. Um, so I believe that you can unmute your line if you would, if you have a question and you would like to um, speak it. You can also type into the chat. Um, I just want to name that we <laughs> threw a lot out there today in terms of information <laughs> and resources, and we we aim to be thorough. But I am um, I know that a lot of us are getting some resource burnout. And so it's this presentation and the resources that we're listing are not intended to be something else to add to your to-do list. Um, they're things that you can take what you need and leave the rest. Um, and I think I just, you know, the other piece of all of this is that we're all doing enough, even if we're not doing everything um, that's out there or that's possible um, surviving right now. And, running on half empty might be our lives. Um, so I will pause for a second and see if anyone has a question or comment. Uh, yes, Jamie, this is Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Hi, hi. Thank you so much to the presenters today for sharing this information. And um, I, you know, we work with families at Child Care Aware of Minnesota. Um, every day. Um, the calls, as you might expect, um, have been abundant recently too, but I just wanted to clarify, um, would this video, can, can we share a recording of this video for families where we feel that this may be a good resource for them, or would you prefer that we refer them directly to your team first, and then how would you like us to? No, know? that's that's a great question. I will, um, and I have mentioned that we'll send out the slides as a PDF, but uh, we also will send you a link to the recording. Um, that said, I'm sure that there are cases where you might additionally want to send them to us for some one-to-one -one support. Yes. Um, and so I, um, but yes, the recording link will be available. Okay. Thank you so much again. Yeah, thank you. I will pause again to see if anyone else would like to chime in. Great, so I will, um, I'm really, really grateful, Terry and Courtney, that you spent your time uh, preparing for this, compiling information and sharing it uh, with families. This type of sharing is what our organization is about and how we as a community of families um, keep from having to create everything from scratch individually. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Um, if anyone does have a question, I will CC Courtney and Terry in the email and um, you can direct it towards whichever one of us uh, you um, would like to. So with that, I will stop the recording and everyone can have a great day.